Donovan Pannone, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you on. You started and run a wrestling academy out in Georgia, and we're going to talk all about the rise of Georgia wrestling and, and what you see going yeah. on down there. But you also just wrote a book, How to Succeed and Fail as a Wrestling Parent. Uh, something very needed, and I'm excited to dive into it. First of all, why did you write this book? So I started it about five years ago. Um, and I've been coaching, I'm on 28 years now. So this would have been, you know, right, 23 years in the coaching, volunteered um, at a youth club. Uh, and then me and another guy that I coached with, we moved to a different youth club after about seven years. And so I was there for about 13 years. And you, you see all sorts of, um, you know, flavors of parents that, that come and go. And, and I coached before I even had kids. And, you know, like my goal is to help the kid achieve whatever, you know, is, is get as far as they can into the sport and love the sport. And I realized how much the parents were part of what was holding them back. So like, it felt like there needed to be a solution. I'm always a problem solver. I'm always trying to fix things, you know? So I felt like there was experiences that I had and, um, you know, little things that I would say to parents that, that would go along with helping the, their wrestler get better. And I'm like, man, I got to document this somewhere, you know, and somebody had suggested to me that I should write a book, you know, and so I was like, all right, maybe. And I started it and then I put it aside for a little bit. I started when about six months into it and I realized that anything that I was going to talk about uh, in, through, throughout the whole journey of high school and beyond, I needed to experience myself. My son had wrestled and, and was wrestling at the time. And so I was like, I got to wait till my son graduates because I can say all these things in theory, but I've never felt them or experienced them myself. So I waited until my son graduated and then I picked back up about a year and a half ago. And I love how you talk about how initially the goal is you want to help your wrestlers get better because you're a coach, but then you started to see the correlation between the parents' involvement and the wrestler. And maybe an example is that Bill Bassett article, which I love that you put in the book where it talks about yeah. if the parent's nervous, and they don't think the kid's going to win, obviously kids can pick up on that. And so your kind yeah. of thesis is that parents a lot of times are wanting their kid to get better, wanting them to win, but they're the reason that they're uh, they're holding them back. Yeah. And it can be lots of different ways. I mean, that that article was great. I don't even know they know that I put it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully they'll hear the podcast and be like, oh, yeah. But what what really struck me about that one was so many of the – nonverbal things that you do, like parents are constantly, especially if they're loud on the mat, which a lot of states they are, you know, maybe they're not coaching from the mat, but they're like mat side and they're are constantly saying, are you ready? Are you ready? You know, mm -hmm. they're like fidgeting their hands constantly and they need to do something. And it's like, mom, back up. Like you guys are projecting so much nervousness. And if you're nervous, that really just tells your kid that you don't believe that they're capable of winning right? Like subconsciously at least. Um, and there's so many things like that. It's not even just, you know, it's not even just the yelling and the parents who get overbearing and who are too hard on their kids. I mean, that's certainly part of it and that can be detrimental. And, you know, that's probably one of the number re one reasons why kids, you know, end up quitting the sport once they start getting a little bit more independent in middle school and high school, you know, that that's a pivotal time. I mentioned that in the book, as far as like, some pivotal ages where they, they fall out of love with the sport. Um, you know, and middle school is a big part of that where they start wanting to think for themselves. They start getting into fights with their parents and their parents are too overbearing and, you know, um, but that's, that's not uh, the whole thing. I mean, that's the easy one, right? All these crazy parents yelling at their kids. I mean, that is a big part of it, but there's so many other factors that go along with it, you know? And what are some of the, the common ways you see that parents, are becoming uh, like hindrances to their kids winning outside of the, uh, the obvious ones you mentioned? Um, you know, I mean, it can be as simple as, you know, the parent scouting a, a wrestler before a match, right? Like, hey, I was watching this kid. And he's got a really good double leg. Watch out for it. Like, so yeah, <laughs> the whole match, right? The whole match, they're watching out for a double leg and they're not shooting. And then the parents will start yelling, what are you doing? Start shooting, shoot, shoot. And then they take a shot and it's a bad shot. 
and they sprawl, you know, get sprawled on and taken down. And then they parent, you know, the kid starts crying. Like, like that happens literally every tournament, you know, <laughs> even telling literally your kid that tournament. you were scouting another kid that alone is warning, yeah. warning. <laughs> yeah. Like, in a half, uh, you know, and they, and, and they mean well, like they'll even say, Hey, watch this other kid. You're wrestling him next. Like, why do we need to watch that other kid? Like, we don't have time to prepare. Like, is the coach, I can watch. I can say, okay, I saw some things, but the parent and the kid don't need to do that, right? Like, even if they're, uh, they're scouting and they see this kid and maybe they don't even say anything, but they're like, damn, that kid's pretty good, right? They start putting this other kid on a pedestal and all the self-doubt starts creeping in and all those little nonverbal body language things starts coming into play. Mm-hmm. you know, and it, it makes the kid feel like they may not win. So yeah, you go into a match thinking you may not win. You're less likely to win. Yeah. And, and to that point, I wonder, I mean, at what level scouting is even relevant? Like, I don't think at a young age that it's like, what are we even doing? Just go out there and, and, and scrap, let it rip, you know? Right. Right. Well, especially at a youth level and through middle school, the the more important thing is that they're developing a, developing a go to set of moves in each position, right? You know, they might be somebody who's quick and and, and you know, yeah, they can hit some shots from space, or maybe there's somebody who's better at tying up, right? But they don't know these things until they're the ones going out there and trying them and executing them and failing and messing up. And if they're so worried about what the other kid's going to do, they're never getting to their offense, right? So that's more important to me that that they're developing their skills, you know, at a younger age, but even like, um, Jaden Cox, he, he's coming to the gym a couple of times and he says he doesn't scout. He just sits right. in the back. It doesn't matter. It's not going to change how he wrestles. He wants to get into a flow. He'll feel it in the match, you know, and there's no mm-hmm. need for scouting. See, exactly. And I think it's, I think at that level, you know, it would be it would be tough to say, you know, maybe a little bit he should be, or at least his coaches should be. But it, it, to your point, you can do well that far up without scouting. So I think, yeah, these I hope that's not happening at these kids' tournaments. But you're there every weekend, and and, and I'm sure it's it happening. is happening. That is that yeah. is insane. Okay, the rule yeah. number one: we don't need to be scouting the other kid. All right. Right. Um, when I think what's what's really cool about this is outside of this book your system of coaching at level up is man you are you're like the a little bit of the tim ferris of wrestling like you're so in the weeds and the details <laughs> and i love how you systematize and break it down because there's this uh legendary kids coach in illinois jose martinez a lot of people wouldn't know who he is but he did this he was like a systematizer and he had it on the wall you're in a cradle this is your six different variations and it just blew my mind the first time I went to his camp, how he had everything broken down. And it sounds like you do that as well. You kind of systematize, like even for like a given week of practice, you'll start with a certain skill and then kind of build on it and add variations from there. Yeah. I, I try to make sure that I'm developing a system that allows still for personalization though, because I'm not going to be somebody who says, here's how we run things and Mm -hmm. here fit into our style. But I am a kind of a nerd and I'm, um, I'm detail oriented. And so I will break down a system or, 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 you know, whatever, whatever the series is, right. Let's say we're working bars or chicken wings, depending on, you know, how you call it, you know, I'm a big believer in chain wrestling is based on predictable reactions, right? So I know if I go here, we're going to plan on these two, three common ways that they're going to counter us. So we're going to plan that series ahead and I'm going to work that series for a couple of weeks. And then not only we're going to work that series, I'm going to put you in situations and scenarios where the partner has to fight you. Um, you know, but I'm also identifying, I, I've done this for so long that I can uh, troubleshoot and see like, coach, I'm messing this up. Where, what's the problem? Well, your, your hand needs to make a fist. Mm-hmm. Your hand is this way or your shoulder's too high. You know, you know, this is exactly what's happening. And so I designed the way the practices are run based on, I guess, the years of experience of seeing kids mess things up so much that I try to head it all off at the past, mm-hmm. you know, without it being too overwhelming. So I break it down into like small manageable chunks first. We'll break, you know, we'll do if the core skill has, you know, if the skill has five steps, we'll work on that first core skill, mastering that a little bit, 
building this one, second step, third step, fourth step. All right, now let's put it all together. Now let's spar it. Now let's put it into a live situation. And that's going to run this course over the course of a week, not mm -hmm. just one practice, you know? Exactly. Now, and it's, it's awesome to hear you break it down like that because I don't know why, but maybe I'm just getting older, but I often find myself like when I'm driving or walking, I'm like, all right, if I had to teach my kid how to wrestle from the start, what's the first thing you would do? And so obviously it's, it's stance. And, and then for a while yeah. I was into BJJ and John Donaher says the number one thing is for jujitsu is getting out of a submission. So I'm like, all right, in wrestling, that's getting off your back. Then I threw that on Twitter and a lot of people weren't a fan of that. that that's how you should start. So I just yeah. want to ask you, like, if you're building this hypothetical wrestler, someone comes to you eight, nine, 10 years old, athletic kid. What are you, what's like the first things you're starting with? Are you doing position? Are you doing single leg takedowns? Like what, what are some of the things you would recommend for a coach listening? So position number one, um, which is stance, but it's also principles, right? Shoulder, knee and toe alignment toe, maybe less so, but right shoulder and knee alignment, putting yourself into an athletic position where you can adjust and move rather than teaching moves, right? Moves are important, but working through a position, right? If you think about the number one reason why people get sprawled on and, and, you know, don't finish their shot, it's because they're not knee sliding and their knees not under their, their, their chest. So we teach knee sliding as a core skill. We teach knee sliding on bottom as a core skill. Um, mm -hmm. right. Like the ability to, to adapt, I can only teach so much in a first season, mm -hmm. but I can teach them core principles that they can, um, not know the exact move to hit, but they can wrestle through a position. Right. I so, think another one you blogged about was like head position, right? That's another like core. Yeah. yeah. Core position. Yeah. We, that's actually one of the best things we did for our beginners practice is we taught them, we do a head position battle. So we teach them stance and motion and all the basics, of course. And then we say, okay, this is what head position is. You know, we're not working ear to ear. You're getting an angle. Here's how to recover and improve your head position. And now we do a live head position battle. Mm -hmm. So that's the example of a core skill that gets broken down. And we're only working that, right? We learn how to stance check first, touch the mat, get closer, make contact the right way, elbows in, and then battle from there, right? Now you can get a couple of headbutts here and there, but <laughs> You know, it, it also focuses them on understanding that wrestling is a physical sport, mm -hmm. you know, and in the beginning, if they don't like that physicality, it's may not be the sport for them. Right. But, um, but yeah, position first head position to me, those are the number one, number one things. Now let's say they've done that for three or four years. They're coming back there in fifth grade and they know all the, the, the fundamentals. What are your, your takedown series? Are you doing like, Hey, people grab, see what I thought about is this, like people grab collar ties all the time. So I'm thinking yeah. of, of the great Satya and his awesome slide by. So I'm like, man, if you could just teach a kid a great slide by every kid's collar tying him and he would dominate, yes. you know? Um, so I just think about stuff like that all the time. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Yeah. So yeah, I've evolved across, you know, over the years a little bit too. And it's like the longer I coach, the less I show, mm -hmm. which is like, yeah, Part of me though sense. goes, damn, I, I wish I wish I would show this. I need to show this too. But I look, the, the, the I'm a percentages guy and I want to teach things that are going to work at all levels, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm showing series, primary series, right? Primary series, doubles, singles, high crotches, um, you know, uh, baseline defense, good go behinds, all the rest, all the basics. But then they've got kids that are going to gravitate towards certain moves. And I still love teaching those kind of moves slide bys. I love over collar shrugs, stuff like that, but not every kid is, is built to hit those things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but the, and this is something I learned too, over time. And I think those are all great, but even a slide by my son used to hit, like we taught a slide by my very first practice. I taught a slide by chained into a claw tilt, right? <laughs> we did the whole, Right. We did the whole Steber, uh, you know, claw tilt wrist series, which is a great, great top move. And it's a great series. I, I, I'm not knocking it. But what would happen is he rode that series for a number of years until he started consistently hitting national tournaments. And they don't touch your head like that. Right. They don't mm -hmm. collar tie and hang and push like they used to. You know, so 
wrestling has evolved and kids get better. And it doesn't mean don't show that move, but it shouldn't be a primary, right? Like it should be a secondary, your knee pull singles or, or sweeps, your doubles, your high crotches, that's still your core. And then you can have a secondary series. That's like a ring around that, that, you know, low singles, um, you know, blast doubles from space. Those yeah. can still be good. Right. Or like a kid who's uh, maybe, you know, is going to be a heavyweight, right? Like I'm not teaching them low singles, but I'm teaching them uh, an underhook to a snatch single and a whole hundred hook series for sure. You know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I know that makes sense when you break it down secondary. Cause yeah, I was thinking low singles and like if people still teaching low singles, I hope so. Cause that that's uh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. underhooks, Russians. Yeah. And the other thing I, that really was violated in Illinois growing up, just the like massive focus on neutral wrestling, but very limited wrestling on the mat. Do you like specifically yeah. break it down to like some days are takedown days and some days aren't, or do you, how do you divide practice? Yeah. So it kind of depends on the, the stage. I, I break everything down into seasons. So you got your youth season and then you've got your. Yeah. Um, we're talking like you know, winter folk, winter folk style season, just winter folk style. Middle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm trying to, I've got a couple principles I try to use. I like to teach offense before defense. I don't teach them on the same day because I want kids to have success um, and, and confidence in the offense they had. And then later on, they get the defense. Now you learn how to counter that because the offense was so good in theory, of course, right? <laughs> uh, now they learn how to deal with those counters, right? You get good at defending those. Now you get good at countering those afterwards. So I'm usually not um, doing top and bottom and neutral all in the same practice. But what I will do is try to take, let's say one week or two weeks, we break down a, a, a neutral series and that has a set of core drills. Um, you know, let's, let's say it's a high crotch, right? So we've worked on high crotches. We've worked on knee sliding and turning the corner. And so maybe the next week we start practice with that knee slide corner turn drill, right? You hit the shot, partner sprawls a couple times, two, three, four times, knee slide, knee slide, knee slide, turn the corner, boom, done, right? Um, that's maybe the core drill for that day. But then we're working a bottom series as the core primary series for that week. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, I love how you break it down like that. You, uh, our minds operate similarly. Where kind of like you said, nerding out, putting it in a series, and, yep. and breaking yep. down practice in our different components. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's interesting. And, and the reason I bring it up is, I believe it was Spencer Lee in an interview I heard he he did, or maybe it was when I was interviewing him. But his dad would only do during the folk style season would regularly do top and bottom only because they wrestled so much neutral in the summer that they would have mm. maybe two days a week where they're only wrestling on the mat. And I didn't, I yeah. never heard anyone doing that. And I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. Pretty hard to do for a youth season though. Cause you've got, you know, like, unless you really have very defined tiers of kids, right. I listened to chase Pammy's interview. I'm actually going to connect with them and, and curious about his whole shirt system. Um, thank you. But thank like, you. you always have new people. Like, excuse me, we're I'm a year round training center, so I'll get new kids coming in all the time that are dropping in from their club programs, and so like, it's hard to just say, hey, we're only we're only doing top this whole season. Mm -hmm. Like, I think people would freak out a little bit. It's a good point. Like, right? every time you you have like in my mind, I have this hypothetical situation. You're envisioning that you have the same 20 kids. They're all the same skill level. They're all right, the same weight right. and they're working out. But obviously, yeah, you got kids popping in. You got, yeah, that's man. My brother and I used to run a club, uh, sex like front when I was 18 to when I was 23. And, you know, looking back on it now, you just forget you're right. Like people pop in sometimes, you know, parents yeah. aren't there to pick kids up. So you never know what's going to happen and you got to be flexible. But I think your big point is, and what's made your club so successful is just the structure you put around it and the thought you put around the different series, I think is is really impressive. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. So a few other things I want to hit on is, one, wrestling in Georgia. I found a blog post. Someone someone made a post. It was uh, back in the message boards. And this is like 2019. And they go, Georgia got third at Cadet Greco Duels. When did they get so good? What the hell is going on? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe at the, at the time I would have thought the same thing, but like, tell me about 
1990s wrestling in Georgia and where it's at now and what's been some of the biggest changes? So there's a, a handful of factors. Um, and I'll try to hit on the core ones. Um, you've got the, the youth, right? So Team Minion and other travel teams started coming up. You know, Cliff and a handful of dads took some kids and started traveling places that, was, you know, they weren't necessarily good, but they knew that they had to get out of the state to, to get good competition, right? So a bunch of crazy dads started traveling around. That morphed itself into um, Team Minion, and then Team Minion had Minion has had a number of different, you know, parent coaches across the the years, and um, you know some club coaches and, and training center coaches that have helped out as well. And so you had this core group, and these aren't the only kids that were good for sure, but it really helped inspire other kids from Georgia. So you had this core group of kids who traveled together and grew up together. And then in 2017, sorry, 2016, um, Lee Dendy, who is, um, you know, one of the original, his son Garrison wrestled, um, he was involved in Minion and started talking to kids like Chase Horn and Matthew Singleton and, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a handful of others to be part of a freestyle and Greco dual team for schoolboy because he looked at it and he goes, man, I, I think we can make a run here. Like we've got some talent and you know, you say that all the time. Oh, this is the year the team's going to win it. But 16, some of the kids finally got involved. He was convinced a bunch of them to not just do folk style and do freestyle and Greco. I got involved. My son was, was getting better uh, at wrestling at that time. And so I got involved and helped coach. Um, Jeff Reagan was the head coach. He's at Woodward Academy and he wrestled at uh, Oklahoma State. Um, and we taught them basics. Christian Flavin, who is one of the, uh, him and his wife, Ashley, are the coaches for Life University's women program. Mm -hmm. Christian uh, was at OTC for a while, big Greco guy. And he taught them all basics, like super basic position work in Greco. Like no throws, honestly. Mm -hmm. It was like no throws, position work, basic stuff. And we took that team the next year and ended up winning Schoolboy Greco in 2017. And we- Dang, That's a big moment. Almost, yes. We had the largest uh, margin of victory in the Greco finals that had ever taken place with having just taught these kids that have been good wrestlers basics. The- Three style comes around. We end up in the finals against your team, Illinois. Who? Who? We we didn't realize how to manage that tournament. We had kids literally with broken shoulders, everything <laughs> taped up. Like they wrestled all of them. We didn't we didn't rotate the the kids right. We just the, our Greco guys were our A guys, right? And there was a oh, couple of placements, right? We just same had our guys. same team, yeah. Yeah, yeah. same guys. We lost by three points to Illinois in the finals. Wow. So, um, but that really inspired a number of generations of, of kids to realize that we could compete at a national level, right? So that same team was the cadet team that got third. Um, we, that run of kids that graduated 2022, uh, 2021, around that time were, I mean, we had super 32 champs. We had Fargo champs. We were, I think we were fourth at Fargo. I believe so. Uh, one of those years, it was crazy. The White and we Henson still have some really good or the Caleb, not white Caleb. I was going to mix up Caleb Henson class. Yeah. yeah. So Caleb, uh, was 2022 kids and animal. Um, oh my God. Yep. And yep, the, he's awesome. his passage in your book. I'm like, this kid is wise beyond his years. He talks about, uh, yeah. When it gets hard, you have to be great. Do the hard things to build your mind. It's just like all the stuff we know, but you really don't expect someone that young to realize it. So he right. was a, so was he just a, a killer coming up? So, well, that's what's interesting, right? He didn't get good until sixth, seventh grade. He was an average, below average wrestler, placed, I think, one time in the kids' state tournament until seventh grade. Mm. Um, he got together with a group and it's, it's, it's in his interview, but like 
there was a homeschool group that got together that was <clears throat> Jackson Smith, who took fifth in the junior worlds last year, Caden McCrary, who wrestles for UNC, who also is a super 32 champ, um, a number of other kids. There's like eight kids and they homeschooled during the day. They had a uh, legendary Georgia coach, Arturo Holmes, come in and do basically a, a private session, a group private session with them during the day. And then they would lift. And then some days they would go to the high school and, and wrestle with the high school team. Um, Such a bunch of maniacs. I love it. Yeah, but they loved it. But, but, but what Caleb talked about, it wasn't just that they did this, right? You could, you could assemble a bunch of kids to work out and it doesn't mean they're going to get better, but they're so ultra competitive that they just pushed each other so hard um, because they hated to lose. They just hated right. to lose. They wanted to one up each other all the time, you know? I mean, and think about that. This kid's a freshman from Georgia who's one of the one of the kids battling, you know, get on the podium this year. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. His to me, the biggest part of that interview that because I did the same questions for every kid, and I had a separate one for him because I'm like Caleb. And I had coached him, you know, I've I've known him for years. He was he was in my room for about three or four years, pretty consistent. Um, I didn't make him what he was. I just didn't screw it up, basically. Um, he's got a number of kid, coaches that have been involved with him throughout the years. Um, but I said, why everybody works hard, right? Everybody does the extra. How are you jumping so fast compared to everybody else? And he said, he doesn't, everything to him is a competition. He makes it a game stands in motion drills. He's trying to win, right? He's trying to go faster, longer, take less breaks. He said the morning lifts at, at Virginia tech. He's trying to be more awake. And the more most fresh I than highlighted else. that. That was my favorite section. He goes, I'm trying to be yeah. the most awake at the morning. I'm like, this kid's a this kid's a maniac. Love it's it. It's crazy. But it, it it's yeah. But it and I say that in the best everything. possible light. That that's the kind of stuff like I'm into. Like you're having a battle yeah. with yourself. Who's gonna be the most awake? Freaking amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome. And he wants to give back to Georgia wrestling too. Like he helped us coach me and uh, another coach that coaches with me, Terry Allison. He's real close with Caleb. He um you know, he came to Super 32 and helped us coach. He's probably going to come to NHSCA with us potentially and help us coach, you know. Yeah, it's interesting reading your book because, like, based on where you guys are at in the country, you have a series of tournaments that are very important to you that weren't necessarily things we thought about. But, like, NHSCAs, you guys are always going to that. And then yep. Super 32 is massive now, but even the middle school tournament, that's a big deal for, for a lot of people, I'm guessing, right? It is, yeah. Yeah, and it's dense. It's... I mean, it's the toughest one, I think. I mean, you know, obviously regionally we're, we're biased, but right. in terms of just pure density, it's, it's so tough. Yeah. When I was in middle school, it was only really Tulsa that you heard about as being the one singular nationals uh, where yeah. you just know murder is real. And it was, but, um, but yeah, super 32 is big now. The NHSCAs, that's cool because you wrestle your grade level. Um, but you mentioned Georgia. You mentioned this guy, Arturo Holmes. I had never heard of him until I got your book. And then <laughs> you mentioned him a few times. I saw him online a few times. Tell me about this guy, man. He seems like a, Gosh. like the wrestling whisper of Georgia. He is for sure. He's been around. So before training centers were ever a thing, even nationally, um, he was the only place to go, right? Like even guys like Pete Yates, um, who, was NCAA All-American. Um, he used to go there. Brooks Clemens, who was Super 32 finalist, he was Fargo champ. He used to go, like everybody went there and he actually, so gosh. Is he I don't like even a know gym or like a garage? Like what's, when you say go there, what's the <laughs> Oh, uh, so it's funny. I laugh because people in Georgia know. So he's had a warehouse that he's had for, I don't even know how many years now. 20 plus years um, that he lives in. So he's got the mats at the bottom and he lives in a top balcony at the top. What? Yeah. This guy so should he be in practices. a movie. He, no, he does. Have you, he has, so Arturo is the best. Um, he's got dreadlocks down to his butt. He's Arturo. If you're listening, wow. we, nobody knows your exact age. I think he's 65 or older. Arturo, you're and coming on the still, podcast, my friend. Yeah, if you're listening. He's still out there doing it. No, he's amazing. If you've ever seen him at tournaments, the people who know know 
He has custom made suits that he's made that have like leopard print or <laughs> um, uh, Jackson Pollock paint splatches all over it. And he wears boots like dressed to the nines. Wow. Arturo's great. He's the, the, he's the godfather of Georgia wrestling for sure. And he has, so he has this building. He lives in the top and does practice at the bottom. Is this yep. like in Atlanta or where is this? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's technically city of Atlanta, but it's right above 285. It's a warehouse. Like nobody lives there. It's literally a, a, a warehouse district. And he <laughs> passionate to just live there and, and, and train people. And he's been doing it for years, years and years. Wow. That is, a, that is so cool. I didn't know that it was it's people. I'm, I'm sure every state has, has a guy like that, but as you're talking about, it, it's reminding me of a few guys here, but man, I, I definitely want to get him on the podcast because it seems like he's just involved in so many aspects of what's going on down there. Yeah. He was, I mean, he's, you know, he doesn't get involved with like, you know, team Georgia and stuff like that, but he was kind of the originator of, of all of it. You right, know? right. There's every, almost any coach who's been in Georgia for any period of time at some point wrestled under him. Yeah, I get it. I get it. He's not like, uh, He's not going to some of these crazy dual tournaments, arranging all star teams. No, he, he's no, got no, the, no, uh, no, no. He's got the. He isn't. I mean, you mentioned a few in your book. I'm like, man, I'm old because I never heard of these. Like the dual tournaments for these youth kids now, there must be something every weekend going on. These every weekend. Teams. Every weekend. Well, it's gotten. I mean, I think in the end, it's good. I think having these opportunities to to compete against higher level competitions, you know, I think it's great done right done you know not every weekend paced mm -hmm. out all the rest but i hate that they're all called national tournaments because mm -hmm. they're you know like they'll come back oh i won such and such nationals and i'm like mm, there was like you know eight kids in your bracket from two states that's not mm -hmm. a national tournament you know like let's there are a few handful of the mid big ones that you can say like you won nationals fargo super 32 you know, world team trials obviously is the big that one. may be NHSA. it. Though. Those three, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because NHSA is great, but it's a step down for sure from Super Thirty Two in Fargo. Yeah, yep. Do they it's still good. have still the tough. USAW folk style nationals at the Unidome? They do. Yep, yep. And that's yeah. still big. It tends to be because it's such. It's right around Super Thirty Two. It tends to get no the a one lot in of April. really good. Kids. Is there one oh, in April still? Sorry, the one in April. Yeah, I'm thinking preseason. Yeah. Yeah. There's one in April still. And it's big, big weight classes, but it does tend to be a little more regional. Yeah. Uh, you get a ton of Illinois and Iowa and Nebraska kids. Um, you get a little more Cali kids. We'll have a handful of kids go out there, but it's not, um, you know, not as, not as many. And plus in April we're, we're dialed into freestyle and Greco. Freestyle. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I know that preseason when you're talking about that, that came along after I, Never been to that one myself, but that's that's got to be pretty big too. I do love the Unidome for tournaments; it's fun, but those are long days in there. I I've coached oh, that yeah. tournament a few times. Um, yeah, no, it's a uh, the tournament people naming the tournaments nationals. Like I think it's more of a marketing thing just to get people there, and it works. But sure, I do think um, there is some level setting that needs to be had for that. Now, when you look at your kind of your philosophy of tournaments. I just want to kind of move into some questions that parents often ask. I'm sure you get all the time. What's the right number of uh, tournaments per year for kids who are in that middle school, fifth grade, to, like eighth grade range? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so and it depends on if they've just started or, you know, they've been wrestling a few years. Um, I say think they've been doing it a few years. They've been doing it. A so few they've been years. doing it a few years. Um, everything to me is kid dependent, right? Mm -hmm. You have to know your wrestler. Um, and it depends too, if they're year round wrestlers or not year round wrestlers. Right. But I think the, and I know this might even sound a lot, but it's not like locally. I think honestly, any a season 50 to 75 matches sounds like a lot. That sounds like a lot. That sounds like a lot. It does sound like a lot. I, I skew it lower. I would definitely skew it lower. But to me, it's more about the quality of matches, mm -hmm. right? Like, so let me, let's, I'll break it down into a couple types of people. So let's say it's a kid that's been wrestling a couple of years, but 
hasn't really started moving its way up their way up into it, like traveling a little bit, right? That that kid needs mat time. And it he needs quality mat time, but he also needs to get confident mastering the skills he already has, right? So like not every weekend, but every once in a while, double bracketing is not a bad thing at a local tournament because you're going to have some of those matches are going to be, um, you know, maybe they last a couple minutes and you get to work on some takedowns, you know, and some of those are more competitive. Um, and, you know, if you go a couple weekends in a row and your kid's like, hey, you know, like, ah, I don't know, man, I've, I've kind of been really pumping it here. I want to take a weekend off. Yes. Mm-hmm. do it you don't have to wrestle every single weekend um now double bracketing they, what how often is this pervasive is this everywhere now because i'd never even heard of this when i was coming up yeah i think you get you know everybody gets ultra competitive everybody wants the most amount of mat time right so you know doing you know 12 u 80 and 85 for example um it's not Oh, so it's weight I, I classes, say, not age brackets. I thought it was 12 and under right. than 14 under. You're saying two you weight classes way in 12 and under? Okay. Yeah, that's the most common. Okay. That's the most common. Um, but you can do it. Some Sometimes you do it by age. And it's not for every kid. It's not for every kid. And the kid, any of these things with mat time, the kid has to be the one wanting it. Yeah. Right? You can't be like, hey, I signed you up for two weight classes this weekend. Ugh. <laughs> what? Like that's miserable. That's that's your kid's not going to get any better. Um, and it, and I know like even 50 sounds like a lot, but if you do, let's just say, um, you know, you've got a, a, a 16 man bracket and you double bracketed, well, you're probably getting eight matches, you know, right. it depends on how well you do, right. You might be getting six to eight matches on a weekend. Um, you go to a dual tournament, and you're getting 10 guaranteed matches at a dual event or something over the course of a weekend, right? That's, that's 20 already over the course of two or three weekends. Right. Right. So you stretch right. out that season across whatever. Now, again, to me, quality is way more important. I my, now I've got middle school wrestlers who are that second level of like, it's not really about the mat time as much as it is about the quality of matches. Like they're winning yeah, the so local got tournaments to, already. Like they've already started right. winning the locals. Yeah. So they're winning the locals and maybe there's a call. It depends on your state and how tough it is, right? PA, you can go locally anywhere and get great matches, Oof. right? Yeah. But Georgia, we have to travel. We have to. The, and we have great, great wrestlers in Georgia, but the depth is not quite the same. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're trying to, and we're trying as Team Georgia too, I'm involved in that. We're trying to hopefully next year have more tournaments where, you want to stay in town because if everybody stayed in town, you're going to have great brackets. Mm-hmm. Um, but my, my middle schoolers that have jumped a level, they don't have that many. They might hit a, a national tournament one weekend. They take two weekends where they don't do anything. Then they've got another national tournament. Then they don't do anything the week after. And then maybe there's a local event, right? And so it's paced out much differently so that they can recover. Mm-hmm. And they're only getting the, the the better matches than like this crazy high volume. Interesting. Yeah, I know that's, man, I've never even thought about some of this stuff that, that you've brought up here. And it's, it's, it's even more important why you wrote this book. And I think the, the chapter that, you know, outside of, of just the whole, the whole thing is awesome, but the chapter on the wrestler's perspective is awesome. And the, uh, the other part I loved is, the parents list of excuses for losing section. This <laughs> yeah. Is page, uh, page 143. I'm going to read a few here. So if you said this, or you're saying this, stop saying this. This is, these are some of my, my favorite ones. Didn't care about winning, just gathering Intel for later. <laughs> um, was just trying new moves. Coach screwed us <laughs> by picking the wrong position. Now you're out there in the trenches every weekend. You're hearing this kind of stuff from, from parents and coaches are like, or like, where does oh, where yeah. do you get these? These are, these coaches are parents, too. Par- coaches too. Well, so, so I'll, I'll say two things. Um, one, some of these are also pre excuses, right? Before, like yeah, that- before the matches ever even start, like, Oh man, we, you know, 
you know, he, he, he was feeling kind of sick last couple of days. So I don't know how we're going to do today. Like stuff like that. But, um, we've all heard this, this one hasn't practiced all week, literally hasn't practiced all week. He's been so sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this came, this originated from a group chat that I'm in with Shane Chittum. Probably heard of Cody Chittum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, um, Bob Killick or Kalich, his son's Michael Kalich, who's, uh, wrestles at Arizona state. Now he was super 32, uh, third and super 32 is things the best he's gotten. He was Fargo champ, um, him, um, Emery Taylor's dad who wrestles at Pitt and Kyle Chittum, who's, um, uh, Shane's, uh, brother, whose son is really, a really good youth wrestler as well. So, and there's a couple others in there, but this started as us starting this small list of like excuses that wrestlers made. Cause we were like making fun of our kids. Right. And then we realized, I was like, I was like, guys, this is actually our excuses. This isn't their excuses. Like we're the ones making these excuses and they're hearing what we're saying. And so we just kept adding to it. Like every time we'd hear an excuse or we'd like remember ones, we would just add to it. Next thing you know, there was like what, what 38 different excuses that parents make. <laughs> There's a uh, 38. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, the one, another one that was funny is, Kid has a famous coach, number 29. There was this yeah. hilarious video on Instagram about a month ago. I think it was at the Reno tournament. And this high school coach sits in the chair and he and the caption is, You won't believe who I have to coach against. And he pans to the right and it's DC. <laughs> yes. That's and actually he, who it was inspired by. Was it? Oh, uh, like that <laughs> yeah. video and the look in the coach's face is so funny because I mean, think about it. It's like freaking DC. I still yeah. can't believe he's he's coaching at the level he is. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Well, so uh, Gabe Arnold is one of my wrestlers and we were coaching him in the Fargo finals against really, really tough kid, Cody Merrill from California. And of course it's DC and Deron Wynn in the corner. And oh we're boy. like, all right, guys, <laughs> we're down. We're down at least two points starting this because these refs, <laughs> these refs are going to be like, okay, hold on. what do you have to say about that? Like, right. Oh, they want to be dabbing up DC after the tournament. You know how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. So Gabe Arnold, Tell me about this kid. He's at Iowa City High right now, right? Yeah, yeah. What's what's his story? So Gabe grew up in Albany, Georgia. His dad, Phil, um, uh, was a coach down there. Opened up a, a you know a training facility down there. He Gabe didn't start. He started like his kindergarten and then didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And Phil didn't even really want him to wrestle. And so he didn't wrestle until again, I think fifth grade he started. Uh, right before fifth grade, kind of corresponding with his dad opening up the the gym, but it wasn't Gabe wanted to do it. Like it wasn't anything to do with his dad opening the gym up. And then they moved up to the Atlanta area. Um, Gabe's right before sixth grade. And so they moved um, not too far from where the gym is. And so he started training with me and he was, you know, he had, he'd done okay. He was pretty like good wrestler, but he, his first time going to AAU duels, um, one of the other coaches took a team. Charlie Morris took a team up there, and Gabe went 0-10 Oof. and got his gut rocked. Um, and Charlie got him an exhibition match with some kid that he thought maybe he'd have a chance of beating. And Gabe won. And this is how Gabe's mind works. So Gabe won this match, and he's like now – like like walking around a little swagger. Like, you know, I just want to, I, I just beat a kid at a national tournament. No big deal. But like in his mind, he could compete nationally. Now he like completely <laughs> erased this Owen 10, you know, thing at this dual meet. Um, but dude, I'm telling you, Gabe learns faster than anybody I've ever seen. Mm. Right. He's, he's, he's a, he's a beast in terms of his physical stature. He's tough. But like I would wrestle him then. <laughs> I do not wrestle him now. Um, and <laughs> I could hit him. He's big, man. He is dude, he's so big. Oh my god. Uh, and I love his, his triceps confidence. are gigantic. Like yeah. he, he's the one who made the comment about Carter Sirachi, right? Yeah. Yeah. Game. I know. I, yeah. But it's good, man. It's because it's I saw it and I loved it. And I didn't know anything about the kids. The first time I, I saw him. But then as I looked into his background, Wyoming Sam, but then today it came yep. up again because it's he's in your book and you know, wrestling your club. But I just, I love everything about that because that tells me the kids won. He's having fun. Like he's, he's yes. having fun out there and he's got a lot of confidence in himself. And we didn't, yep. you and I both know this. 
if you have two kids, they both could be technically the same. They drill everything perfectly. But if one's naturally confident, the other's not, it's just a world of difference. It's yeah. It's world unexplainable. Difference. It's so, crazy. Yeah. So he that's starts his coming, biggest talent. Really? Yeah. You, yeah. you could tell. So he, he starts, you know, doubling down, gets, gets real good. How did he end up at Wyoming Sem? So Georgia, like some of the other states, um, they don't let our teams travel to places like Beast of the East and Ironman because Blair and the schools that have uh, postgrads uh, that could enter, they, it's some archaic football rule, but it doesn't matter. That DHSA is, is killer. That ruins you right there. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know they had that. Yeah, it's bad. We we can only do a few handful of tournaments. Like Woodward Academy took a couple of kids to Doc B, uh, Matthew Singleton and Killick, and a few guys a few years ago. But other than that, the major ones, that whole circuit of high school events during the season, we can't go to. So um, Gabe was deciding where he was going to end up going to high school. There was a, a a couple of them, you know, he he almost ended up at where my son went, and and that's where R.J. Weston, who wrestles at U and I, was at. He almost ended up at, at Woodland where Jackson Smith and Caleb Henson and Kate McCrary were. Um, but they talked to a couple other private schools and talked to some, and that just was the right fit at the time. Right. Like um, it was hard for them, him going away and being away from home um, as a freshman. I can't even you know, imagine your sure. kids doing that. It's just, yeah. It, you tip your hat to him. Cause that's, that's a brave soul. I wasn't ready to do yeah. it when I was 18, let alone when I was 14. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so, you know, but it was a good experience for him. Um, but I think, you know, once he committed to Iowa, it just made a lot of sense to, to head out to Iowa city and, and wrestle there and get acclimated um, and, and be part of the Hawkeye culture, you know, in state to wish let's not forget. Yeah. Yeah. True, <laughs> that probably true. helps, but now he, yeah. he's unbelievable. And for him to be able to be at that Iowa state tournament and, I would say tournament's amazing. And I, yeah, I just, uh, I love his swagger and I'm excited to see him, see him in the lineup, you know, whenever that happens, but it's, uh, it's just amazing that, and not news to you, but amazing to see what a state can do. If you put concerted effort into it, if you put coaches who care about it, like you do and like Cliff do and all these other coaches, it can happen anywhere, man. Like it's a, it's awesome to see that. Yeah, really can't. And that, so, so, right. That's, I guess, going back to the factors of why Georgia started rising, it wasn't just the travel kids. I mean, that, that helped for sure, but there's a number of coaches in Georgia who are been selfless, right? They, they care more about improving the, the quality of the kids and they really care about the kids. And, you know, when we've gotten together and coached, like there's not this us versus you mentality, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's what's best for the kids, what's best for the state. Um, and, and that's really gone a long way, right? There's some, there's some quality coaches down here for sure. Well, and like you think about what kind of time commitment it is to be a coach. And now that I'm in, into my adult years, I look back and I just think, how the hell do these coaches do it? And I'm just thinking of the high school coach, November through February, that alone, you're not yeah. getting home till 536. You're gone every Saturday. That's a deal breaker for most people. Then you go to the youth level. It's now October through March. It's all day Saturday. It's 6.30 to 8 at night every week. It's like these people are, you know, they're, it's just amazing that there's that many coaches out there willing to do it. And I, I don't think, I'm sure people do realize, but I never realized how much of a time commitment it is to do that week yeah. in and week out. And then you have that next level of, of, uh, of coach that's doing the, the stuff you're talking about dual tournaments every week and Virginia beach duels. That's another, that's a rare breed. That's another level. Yeah, it is. And it's, you know, and I did it for a number of years with zero pay. I did, I volunteer coach for 21 years. Right. You know, and it, right. Right, it's, it's crazy. I mean, like at least then there was a little break over summer. Cause I, I would coach freestyle and Greco as well. Um, not, I wasn't, when I was younger, I wasn't involved with Fargo and all the rest, but I ran a, a the, mm -hmm. the club program that I was at. We, I, we ran a little freestyle thing out of that for the local area. And so we would still do the Saturday tournaments locally, you know, and then once summer hit, we were, you know, it was off, but like the commitment for these people who are, especially there's a lot of them that aren't parents. Like when you're a parent, you naturally want to be involved if you, especially if you were a wrestler. And so it's not as big of a deal, but there's a number of coaches even here in Georgia who 
volunteer their time week in and week out at the tournaments and they don't even have kids who are wrestling. Those are they the ones the that I'm talking about. Like if they're still yeah. coaching after the kid goes through or if they never had a kid and they just love doing it. I'm, and even the people who are parents who are coaching, it's still an amazing thing because we all know that one coach could change someone's life just by something they say one day. Like it doesn't have yeah. to, you, you, like the, the power um, and the influence influence is a better word. It's so big and it's so important that every, you know, a lot of kids can just remember that one thing the coach said. So thank you all the coaches out there. It's amazing. And I just think it's uh it's cool that you're giving them resources to help run their practice. Your website um, is it level up wrestling.com or is it just level up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's levelupwrestling.com. I love how you systematize it. You have like a guide for how to structure the season, how to do weight cutting, which is that's it. I want to ask you about that and uh, just some drills to do. So I think it's it's really cool that you're doing that and putting all that in. Let's hit on the weight cut topics because this is something I'm mm -hmm. curious about. Do you yeah. recommend it? Um, like, is it off limits for kids certain ages? How do you how do you think about it with your guys? So. Youth wrestlers, no. Uh, and I, when I say youth, um, fifth grade and below, right? Like, I definitely don't think and, – and in the, the, the guide, the weight-cutting guide that I made, I, I was very deliberate by defining managing weight versus cutting weight, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's a big difference between um, – you know, because you hear parents who are naive to it. We're like, oh, well – you know, we didn't want to drop down to, to 90 pounds because they weighed 91. Like, well, I, I mean, that's not really cutting weight. That's cleaning up what you eat for a week. And, and you know, like that's not that's cutting fair. weight. There's yeah, some that's things fair. you can do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But um, I don't think really fifth grade and below and even certain sixth graders for sure don't need to be cutting weight. And I think it should be. Uh, what's the word I'm thinking for? Like deliberate in terms of like when you're when you're sixth seventh eighth grade if you're starting to hit puberty there's always going to be some tournament coming up the local tournaments for sure no you don't need to be cutting for those um the national tournaments it depends on how competitive you are honestly mm -hmm. right like and and if you're one of these kids that's every weekend national middle school duels um you know uh, tulsa wildwood um you know, super 32, like, and you're doing all that whole circuit. The more you're consistently cutting weight, you are preventing your body from growing. I mean, you really are. Yeah. So you need to be strategic about which ones are the most important ones that you need to cut for. Because the problem that happens is the, the kids and the parents, they get these calls from these dual, these guys that do these dual events. And these are great. I don't, I don't think dual events are bad, but there's one every weekend. There's right. literally something every weekend and the, you know, they get the call, Hey, you know, can we have uh, Johnny wrestle? You know, we need him at 80. Like I know he wrestles 85, but man, our team's are really solid and he's a stud like, okay, yeah, we'll do it. And they don't even tell their kid. And they're like, Hey, you're doing 80 next weekend. Like dad, I weigh 88 right now. Like, ah, you can do it. Suck it up. And, and so they're cutting weight. To... Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No. Yeah. I'm just saying like they're, they're cutting weight every single chance they get. Like that's miserable. That's actually one of the reasons why kids burn out. It's not because they're wrestling too much. They're wrestling too much when they're made to wrestle, um, when they don't want to wrestle, or they're they're just constantly traveling and cutting weight. Like that's miserable. Miserable. And also, these people need to realize that this thing of doing a dual tournament where you're weighing in that is a new concept. That only back in the mid two thousands which is my era I can relate to that happened once a year in March after the kids state tournament. If you were lucky, you got picked to go on the yeah. Illinois USAW dual team. And it was one week in a year. Virginia beach was just kind of popping off Disney duels. That was it though. Like, so there's so many of them now, which is awesome, but it's also a little frightening that some parents don't know that you don't have to do that. And I would even go right. as far as to say, no cutting, cutting weight before high school, the, the 91 pounds, the 90, I get it. That makes sense. But I'm talking like, all right, it's Tuesday or it's Monday night and you're five to six over. That's, that's a little weight cutting. And that's, um, yeah, yeah, it's just, it sure. is just so miserable. And uh, you know, we all cut weight in middle school, but I'm just looking back now on how 
much it sucked. <laughs> and if I had my kid, I don't know if I would encourage it, but you know, younger than uh, really younger than like, to me, like maybe like the first time you go to like cadet nationals at Fargo, or if you're going to super 32. Um, but I mean, I guess every, every tournament holds a special meaning to each wrestler. So it's, it's variable, but it's, um, it's just one thing yeah. that just a surefire way to make someone miserable, you know? Right. And you don't have to cut. That's like, it, I mean, it, it somewhat depends on the kid too, right? Some kids are like Caleb is a master at cutting weight, right? But the way he does it is so systematic, right? And that's why I tried to like capture that in the guide. It was more like, right. okay, if you do have this big event coming up and you're going to do it, here's how to do it. Here's right. how to do it, right. Caleb starts weeks out, cleans up the diet, loses as much fat as possible the, the right way, hydrates himself the entire time. Like, and, and Caleb can sweat like anything, right? He'll lose four pounds in a practice, mm -hmm. right? So like he's able to do that and not everybody is able to do that. Some people, you, you shrink your portion sizes a little bit and eat healthy and they're like, oh my God, I'm so weak. Like, okay, stop. <laughs> right. But they can't handle it. Right. Um, the, uh, uh, where was I going with that? Just the, uh, just the, how you said, basically, if you're going to do it, this is one way to do it. And not that you're like encouraging it or anything, but I think the guy, no, 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 no. But that's what I think is, you right. Know, oh, I right. So that, that. yeah, that's, that's where I was going with it. Right. Um, not everybody has to cut weight to be competitive. RJ Weston uh, the one I was telling you that wrestled for you and I, the, he won cadet um, nationals in Fargo for Greco, got third in freestyle. He wrestled 52. He started his cut, wasn't a cut, at 157. He walked around naturally at 157. Mm -hmm. So he just had to clean up his diet, you know, maybe drop a couple pounds of water, and he was fine, and he won Fargo. Like. Right. You don't have to cut weight to be competitive. No. Everybody thinks you have to, and you end up hurting yourself when you cut too much weight, thinking you have to do it all the time. And the real way to hurt yourself is everyone knows someone who has decided to cut for a certain season, and halfway through the season, they hit a growth spurt, and then they cut through yeah. it, and they actually stunt their growth. Like, that's real, and that happens all yeah. the time. So, yeah, like, that's sure. just, man. It's it's one of the, the negatives, but there's so much positive about this sport, and people like you who are out there I can't imagine the amount of lives you've changed. And, and through this book, I really, uh, I can't stress enough to parents and, you know, even some kids I think would find value in this, but certainly parents, you know, how to succeed and fail as a wrestling parent. It's really professionally done that the cover, everything, it's just, it's very legit. And I'm very grateful that you put it out there. Any last, last words, words before, before we sign, we sign off, off coach? coach? No, I mean, I just, you know, I really appreciate you having me on. It's, I think, I'm, I'm just hoping to get the word out about the book in terms of, um, you know, just being a positive, um, you know, uh, influence out there to the parents. Cause I've been there. I've know it. I felt it as a parent myself, you know, I've seen it as a coach and, you know, I'm just hoping that, you know, the, the sport is better because of hopefully, you know, I've had some small impact on it. There's no question you have, and it's not small. And I, you know, there's, I think back to my old mother, single mother, knew nothing about wrestling, taking me to these tournaments. We knew nothing. And uh, this book would have been would have been valuable. So I think it's going to be uh, really powerful and I'll do as much as I can to promote it. Thank you so much for coming on and wish you nothing but the best, man. All right. Appreciate it, Ryan. Yes, sir. Thank you. That was fun, man. Thank you very much. Let me uh, let me grab the address before yeah. I forget. Okay, yeah. I was about to remind you. Hit me. You're right. right. Three. It's 391. Ridgewater Drive. That's Marietta, Georgia. M-A-R-I-E-T-T-A. Mm-hmm. 30068. Got it. Cool. And what shirt size are you? Large. Large. Cool. Excellent. Nobody, nobody freak anybody out with the number of matches. No, I, I wanted to, I wanted to cycle back to and kind of say, let's maybe make sure Ryan said this type of kid, not beginner. Like beginners no. don't need to be wrestling 50 matches in a year. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll, I, I don't think so at all. I think it's, 
I think it's just a good gut check to understand what's going on. And, you know, when you put it in the context, like you did, um, yeah, no, I'll listen to it though. But if I think it sounds crazy, I can cut it out too. If you, if you didn't think it was a, a fair representation. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. Either way. Okay. Way, I just, you know, cause some people are on the, um, you know, there, there's some coaches who have this and I, I don't want to say who, but, Early on, before we started really coaching a lot, they were only open a couple of years and they had this big rant about how competing is bad and, you know, you shouldn't be doing that much competition. And, you know, and it's a naive way to look at it because wrestling is about competition, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's a, you can teach all the moves you want, but until you actually go out there and apply it, it's totally different. It's a totally different feel when you have to learn how to win a match compared to learning moves. And I just think if you do it right and you're like, I tried really hard right now as an early age, like when you get early on, like we got the kids state tournament this weekend. And so I'm talking about like the excitement to compete, right? Like changing that mindset from being nervous to being excited to compete mm-hmm. and wrestling. And so if you're, if, if, if the kids are treating wrestling as fun, competing should be fun competing shouldn't be stressful. And if the parents are doing it right, it shouldn't be stressful for them either. So like, like I think it can compete and learn how to compete now, five, six, seven. No, they don't really need to be competing. Right. No. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Eight years old. Yeah. Like it's fun to get out there and scrap. Like that's part of it. So like when they're young, they don't need to be wrestling that many matches, but as they start getting more experience two years into it, like, if they're enjoying the sport, competing should be something they're looking forward to. Like my son was always like, where are we going this weekend? I want to wrestle this weekend. Like yeah. I want to do two brackets. Like, like, okay. I mean, that's yeah. this, this is what you want to do. Like, all right. You know? So, absolutely. No, uh, you just have to approach it the right way. Absolutely. And it's, um, there's a prac, there's a skill in being able to handle the pressure of a competition too. And that's a learned skill. And so right. that, that all goes into it. That is a learned skill. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, I think it went great and I can't wait to, uh, to share it. And, and I did really appreciate the book. And like I said, man, a lot of times you see wrestling projects and you're like, man, that's not professional, but this is legit. The, the, the texture on the front's good, the graphics. So it's all good, man. I really, really appreciate that you did this. Yeah. Thanks, man. Appreciate you got me on. Really do. No problem. Have a good one.